Uh, you've uh, stated in earlier, earlier conversations that he was important for a lot of uh, struggling women writers at the time. Well, Whittier, you know, came up as a newspaper man for the most part. Uh, he did not have an advanced education and he, he probably had an education that was more in line with what many of the women, aspiring women writers had had, that is, not so much formal education, no college education. And therefore, he, um, uh, he had a certain kind of, I think, cultural sympathy uh, with people who, who weren't you know, of the privileged classes or of the privileged ranks. So what he would often do, partly this would be in his abolitionist publications, and the women were the spearheads of the abolition movement, really. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the great arguments in the abolition movement was whether women's suffrage constituted a, a similar kind of slavery. Uh, Whittier, um, Whittier believed that it was not as bad <laughs> as real slavery, so he used to put it sort of secondary. But in his newspapers that he edited, he would very often solicit uh, poems, especially, and other kinds of writing from, from women writers. He collaborated, sometimes silently, with women writers in, in order to produce uh, collections of poems and prose, especially for children, that he would then um, divide the, he'd use his name to sell the book, but then he would split, uh, he would split the royalties with them. And I, actually, there's one of those royalty checks, I think, in this collection. There certainly is a letter uh, that he wrote to Lucy Larkin where he enclosed a royalty check. Uh, and Lucy Larkin was one of these people like him who had worked in factories. He worked in a shoe factory. She worked in a textile mill. Uh, she fought her way through to become self-educated and was one of the founders of Wheaton College up in uh, Northern Mass. And, um, and Larkin and Whittier were collaborated on at least three volumes. He published her works in, in the national era before she, anybody knew who she was. And, um, and he split royalty checks almost literally up to the day he died. Uh, so that uh, she always had that stream of income that he helped, helped generate. There are other women that, that he was close to, too. He was very close with Annie Fields, the uh, widow of his publisher, James Fields, at Tickner and Fields. Uh, he was very close with um, the Carey sisters, who were abolitionist poets. Uh, he was very close with, um, well, her name has skipped my mind, the woman who lived out on, who ran the Appledore Hotel out in the Isles of Shoals, and uh, uh, Thaxter. Um, and they were, actually he'd go out and see her out in the Isles of Shoals. But the, he, his, his relations with women writers were probably more comfortable and uh, much more close than I think he was with the men. Because he didn't drink, he didn't smoke cigars, he didn't like to sit around in, in rooms and do those kinds of boy stuff, those kind of boy things. Uh, he was much more comfortable with the tea and with the women and with, and with matters of that sort, even though he was never married. You also mentioned in earlier conversations uh, that his, the, the flow of his work somehow reflects uh, movements in U.S. publishing. Yes, well, I would say that that probably has more to do with his publishing firms than anything else. But if you look at his earlier books, they're really not very attractive. These are the ones from the 30s. You might have a very small format little book like this, like Mog Magone from, I think it's 1835, 36. There's a little bitty book like this that you could, it's really very delicate, it could fall apart, and it's not remar remarkable except for its you know, small size. His earlier books were put in very plain paper, uh, paperboard, uh, paper wrappers, or just plain old board wrappers with a little label paste on the, bun on the front. By the um, 1840s, when he hooks up with Tickner and Fields, uh, then you start seeing American publishing adapt itself um, to, um, to new markets. Tickner and Fields originally uh, used their covers, I think, as a kind of a brand 
That is, they had a, a kind of brown, I don't have an example of it here, but they had a kind of brown, chocolate brown um, cloth that they used on all their publications. All their publications had gilt titles on, and they had the Tickner and Fields, the TF lozenge, lozen usually on the, on the spine. Uh, and um, they established a kind of look. Hawthorne published with them, Whittier published with them, Longfellow published with them. If you look at their books from the 40, late 40s and 50s, they all look alike. Uh, it's the Tickner and Fields brand that they, they sort of participate in. Well, Tickner and Fields kind of likes establishing that brand, but then by the, about the late 50s and 60s, especially when James Fields starts taking over the marketing more and more, uh, he starts experimenting with different kinds of, of publications rather than just single volumes of new poems, for instance. Um, Fields will instituted the so-called diamond um, uh, editions. These would be really cheap, smaller print, but they would be uh, so cheap that anybody almost could buy them if you, if you read it all. Uh, and then he also started publishing, experimenting with different um, different formats. If you were rich in the 1830s or 1820s and you bought a book, uh, it probably came in paper wrappers or just plain gray cardboard with a pasted on label, the way Early Whittier did. Uh, if you were rich, you would take that to a binder. It might be the same bookstore you bought, bookseller you bought it from. You'd take it to a binder and have it bound, usually in some kind of leather. Um, what Fields did was um, he tried to break that market by marketing um, the same book in different formats. Uh, for example, this is uh, the first edition of Whittier's most famous poem, Snowbound. You can see it's not in a brown chocolate wrapper, it's in blue. I've got first editions of Snowbound in blue, in red, in green. I mean, I've seen them in green. Uh, I've seen them in brown. Um, but. Um, Clearly what Fields is doing there very simply is varying the color of the cloth in order to give a kind of, you know, you could, you could choose what color, you know, you wanted your books to be, so you'd have a kind of aesthetic appeal of the book. Two years later, he brings out Snowbound in an illustrated edition. Now, this edition of Snowbound is the one that was of, bound in full Morocco, Morocco leather, with a full tooled um, cover and all the, you know, the, the bands on the spine and all of this stuff, um, trying to look like one of those books that you would normally, in the old days, have had, had paid somebody extra to buy for you. Uh, but what Fields did is he brought this book out in three different formats, three different bindings, at three different prices. You could buy it for as cheap as a dollar and a half, this volume would have cost $10 in 1867. And $10 in 1867 would be like buying, a, I assume, something like a $250 or $300 book uh, today. Um, so you're marketing to different levels of the public with the same basic you know, type block. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a, a neat thing that he does. Uh, later on, this develops pretty steadily through the 1860s and 1870s. And then in the 1880s, you have in England and in different parts of the United States the so-called book arts movement, where you start experimenting with old-style type fonts, uh, typefaces. You start experimenting with a richer kind of lush paper to look like something like a Renaissance or a medieval publication. You start trying to make your books look more like manuscripts uh, these were extremely expensive. This is the stuff that William Morris was doing in England. But uh, the Tickner and Fields folks, and here I think it's Henry Houghton, uh, who later became, uh, who later took over the company and renamed it Houghton Mifflin. Henry Houghton starts looking, gets really interested in these book arts movement things, and starts trying to do <coughs> American mass market publications uh, in the same kind of um, in, in ways that look like book art stuff, but actually are, are fairly inexpensive. And the first time he does that with Whittier is with this little book called St. Gregory's Guest and Recent Poems. It's kind of an odd poem for Whittier to be writing as a Quaker about St. Gregory 
Um, but <clears throat> he does, and uh, he puts it into this volume that looks like this is how a Morris volume would have looked, except instead of a kind of slicky paper wrapper, uh, it would have been, uh, for Morris, it would have been vellum. That is, it would have been uh, sheep skin. Um, but this looks like vellum. It's got the same kind of gold decoration that you'd see on a Morris book, but you could sell it for you know a dollar and a half, two dollars, because the, the actual materials uh, look like it without being it. He's even got the kind of look of the uncut pages here uh, that you would have in one of these sort of Morris books. Um, then he does it, he goes a little step further by about 1790 or so, and he, he develops these. He starts putting it, gluing it onto boards like this. This is a copy of Snowbound also, an illustrated copy of Snowbound. It's got the guild, it's got the, um, uh, the font that looks like manuscript calligraphy. Uh, and, and it comes out, this came out in large and small paper formats. The large paper format uh, was limited to, I think, 250 copies. So it would have been very rare and expensive. And yet you had a small paper format that was about this size. You know, in which they used the same type lock, but they didn't, um, it wasn't quite so big. This actual volume uh, was um, given by Whittier to his niece, Elizabeth Whittier Picard, who was, in fact, uh, for all intents and purposes, his adopted daughter. His brother Matthew was something of a ne'er do well, and beginning in the 1860s, uh, Lizzie Picard, Lizzie Whittier pretty much lived uh, with Whittier and uh, he paid for her uh, education. But this is signed by him, Elizabeth W. Picard, from the uncle, from, from her uncle, John G. Whittier, October 2nd, 1891. So it's a, it's a fairly special volume and it includes uh, a portrait of Whittier that um, what I would call this extra illustrated uh, in that it doesn't really show up anywhere. It isn't supposed to be in the volume. Uh, thank you, Professor Graber, for giving us this introduction to the John Greenleaf Whittier Collection at Providence College. Uh, we hope that you will return for another visit and further discussions on this collection. Thank you. Thank you.